Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Advocates for Women welcomes you to our first educational event of this year and Reproductive Justice for All. My name is Ingrid Mountain, and Karen Keenan and I will be presenting this program to you today. I've been a member of AUC and Advocates for Women for about five years, give or take. Um, and I love this congregation, and especially the women in our wonderful committee. Okay, since 2010, advocates have donated, with your help, over $55,000 to a variety of local <laughs> to local and worldwide organizations benefiting women and girls. We advocate for women at the local, state, national, and even international level, and are involved in the EUC lobby group each year during the legislative session. We work to raise awareness among ourselves and the congregation about challenges facing women. This is an exciting year for advocates as we work toward approval of the Reproductive Justice Stand to be voted on in May 2023. Advocates for Women has proposed that EUC adopt a new stand that resolves reproductive justice is a fundamental human right. Why is this important? Well, first, because as Unitarian Universalists, our UU principles align with reproductive justice. Our first principle states that we believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every person. Our second principle states we believe in justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. These are reproductive justice values. And secondly, advocates for women along with most of you were devastated with the overturning of Roe versus Wade. This was a reversal of a fundamental human right. But it did, but it, um, we spent several years educating and advocating for this issue, hoping the day would never come. But it did, and we grieved. And we picked ourselves up, dusted ourselves off, and continued educating ourselves on new strategies that create greater reproductive equality. Amen. <laughs> we are here to talk to you today about this equitable strategy called reproductive justice. I'm going to turn this just a little bit. For our program today, we're going to cover three topics. First, we'll provide an overview of reproductive justice and how it developed into a movement. Secondly, we'll learn why access and intersectionality are integral parts of reproductive justice. Third, we'll see how reproductive justice aligns with Unitarian Universalism. And before we wrap up, we'll answer any questions you may have, or try to answer them. Now, to provide an overview of reproductive justice, please welcome Karen Keenan. Karen is a current and past co-chair of Advocates for Women. Okay. Oh, you know what? I don't have my glasses here, and I don't know where they are. What do they look like? Um, they were here. And they are sort of sanity colored earpieces? Yeah, well, no. Oh, okay. okay. Do you know where they are? I do. Eric, do you know where everything is around here? Hello, everyone. And uh, well, as we wait for Eric to get my glasses, which uh, which I hope he does, like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a two reader. Anybody in the audience a two reader? <laughs> ah, Julie, but you don't you didn't have your glasses either, did you, Julie? I don't have my glasses today. Yeah, I know. What is this? I want to thank you for being here today. Though so I'm going to wait for Eric. Sorry about the delay. I'm going to think about the glasses. He knows where they are. They were left here by mistake, huh? That'll teach him. 
Nothing's a mistake. <laughs> How was the lunch today? Awesome. Right? Well, our great Marilyn Parsons and Ellen and the other members of, of the group did a great job. See, it wasn't a mistake here. They were supposed to be here. <laughs> Karen needs to see. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you. Okay, let's get started. Uh, thank you, Ingrid. Um, Ingrid's also uh, been a past co-chair of Advocates for Women, and uh, like Ingrid, I have been a member of the church for five or so years, although with COVID, I'm not sure how that works, you know, but, um, but I've been happily and lovingly a member of this congregation, as well as a member of Advocates for Women, the, uh, one of the group that is true to my heart. And so today I'm here to talk about reproductive justice. So today we're going to talk about what reproductive justice is, the framework of the movement, how it originated, and how reproductive justice can be achieved. We've all heard various uh, phrases regarding reproduction tossed around in the press and by, in general, how we say things. We hear phrases like reproductive rights, reproductive health, reproductive justice, to name a few. While we say these phrases thinking they are the same, actually each of these phrases involves a specific focus of work different from the other. Now as you read these phrases, you might think how they might be different. The word health, the word right, the word justice, they mean something different. And while we're thinking about those phrases, you might think, which one would have the broadest, most expansive framework to it? Now, I'm sure many of you can think of differences between these, and my hope is that by the end of this program, you will realize how these phrases are different, yet related and that reproductive justice encompasses a broader intersectional framework that addresses various reproductive oppressions. You will then have a clear understanding of why we have focused on reproductive justice for the stand. So let's define some of these reproductive phrases. We'll start with reproductive health. The reproductive health framework focuses on the necessary health services that a person needs, such as a clinic, a hospital, or Planned Parenthood. Reproductive health is a much needed and very specific focus of work. Next is the reproductive rights framework. Now this framework focuses on an individual's legal protections and an individual's right to care. And as we know, any reproductive legal right and protection are greatly affected by elected officials and state governments. And those are greatly affected by anti-abortion organizations, disinformation campaigns, and religious beliefs that restrict access to health care. Rights are always in jeopardy of the next elected official. Again, a very specific focus. And the last is the reproductive justice framework, which focuses on autonomy, access, and equity for all. This framework is actually based on the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights that details both the rights of an individual and the responsibility of a government to protect those rights. The initial structure for reproductive justice was written with the knowledge that autonomy, access, and equity for all shed light on the intersectional ways people's lives are affected.
affected by the wide range of reproductive oppressions. Because reproductive justice is a basic human right, this framework includes, but is not limited to, reproductive health care and reproductive rights. This makes reproductive justice the broadest framework, allowing all the frameworks to join together to provide a complementary and comprehensive approach of service, of advocacy, and of organizing, which are crucial when you're advancing any movement. Reproductive justice has a simple basic rights theory. The theory is that it's an individual's right to decide to maintain personal bodily autonomy, to have children, or to not have children, and to parent the children we have in safe and sustainable environments and communities. Can I get an amen on that amen. one? Amen! Right. <laughs> Thank you. Equitable human rights for everyone. I think we can all agree on that. So let's talk a moment about how this movement originated. Reproductive justice was developed and led by women of color to broaden the 1970s feminist agenda that mainly focused on pregnancy and legal access to abortion. This directed a coalition of black women to articulate a more comprehensive and realistic agenda that combined reproductive health with social justice to create the movement Reproductive Justice. This same coalition of black women, along with many other women of, of color-led groups, came together to create Sister Song Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective. This organization is the first and currently the largest organization for reproductive justice. The Unitarian Universalist Association has joined in partnership with Sister Song to bring reproductive justice to the UUA membership at large in the United States. Advocates for Women at EUUC has followed Sister Song's vision and theories in the development of the pro uh, proposed EUUC stand on reproductive justice. It's a very important group of women. Now these women were frustrated and they were concerned over the politicized pro-choice, pro-life paradigm that we all know, but that paradigm did not look at a pregnant person's situation from a social justice lens. The women of color saw choice as a falsehood because it divided people in policy and practice because it assumed that all people have an equitable and, and even ability to make the same choices. In addition to the access situation, the choice paradigm did not focus on the right to have children or to not have children or the ability to parent our children in safe and healthy communities and environments. So rather than to seek to only provide choice for individuals, reproductive justice seeks to ensure access for everyone by addressing the various barriers to care and resources that go beyond legalization. Reproductive justice is a more nuanced approach that acknowledges that one's reproductive destiny is directly linked to the conditions in your community. And these conditions are not just a matter of individual right or choice. In fact, there are several societal power inequities that impact a person's reproductive life. Some, ex 
examples of power inequities include social institutions, like our government, big one, education, religion, environment, inner cities, living in inner cities, living near factories. That affects your reproductive justice. Economics, low-wage jobs or no jobs, and your very own cultural differences are some of the, of the power inequities that impact a person's self-determination to make reproductive justice choices in their lives. Now, I want to mention that while this intersectional theory called reproductive justice was created and led by women of color, it is now considered a universal theory, and it applies to everyone. We have enough to thank for that. So how can we achieve reproductive justice? To achieve reproductive justice, we can analyze power systems. Reproductive politics, which is huge and alive, in, U in the US especially, is based on gendered, sexualized, and racialized acts of dominance that occur on a daily basis. Reproductive justice seeks to understand and eradicate these nuanced dynamics. We also need to address intersecting oppressions. Marginalized women, girls, and people in the 2S LGBTQ plus communities face multiple oppressions, and we can only win freedom by addressing how they impact one another. Now, in addition to analyzing power systems and addressing intersecting oppressions, we need to center the most marginalized. <clears throat> Reproductive rights and health strategies have often left marginalized people like the disabled or people in the LGBTQ communities without the choices that the legal rights provide. So we have legal rights, but they don't have the choices. And we all know our society will not be free until the most vulnerable people are able to live their lives without fear, discrimination, or retaliation. And last but not least, to get the most out of this movement, we must join together across issues and identities. All oppressions impact our reproductive lives. So I have a question for you. Some of you may be wondering how relevant the reproductive justice movement is to us here in Washington State, where we have pretty good abortion and reproductive rights. But I'm here to tell you there's more work to be done. So question, where do you think Washington State has reproductive injustices? I want you to think amongst, talk amongst yourselves for a minute or two, and then we're gonna do a shout out. Where do you think Washington State has reproductive injustices. I'm going to give you a minute. Anybody? Injustices. Awesome. Anybody else? 
the hospital systems. Well, it's like I planted her there, I swear to God. It really is. It's like I planted you. All right. <laughs> Anyone else? Our, oh. Absolutely. Rural count. Thank you. It's like I planted her too. I didn't. All right, Cynthia, can you please advance? Here are four qualifying answers, and one of them, as Joyce pointed out, Washington State is a hotbed for religious aff affiliated health care. We have one of the lowest proportion of secular hospital beds in the country. Religions are running our hospitals. Which ones? Well, you know what, sir? Thank you for asking. <laughs> And I am going to let Ingrid Nauman talk about that more when it's her turn to come up and present because she's going to give you more information on that. And, but they, this is a real huge issue in our state. So that's one qualifier. The other is abortion access is being delayed by the influx of out-of-state patients. We have a, we have a, I believe there's 30 some counties in our, anybody know the exact number of counties, Kate? I think you, 30 counties in the state. One fourth of them do not have any reproductive care in our state. So that's also something. And also access to reproductive care is not equitable because there are many counties without them. I already said that, sorry. We also have um, healthy and sustainable environments are lacking in many places, including rural spaces and places where the poorer people live. They're lacking care. So like I said, there is work to be done until every person has the power to make their own informed decision about their body, their sexuality, and their future, our work is not over. And so it is, because here we are today in 2022, finding ourselves struggling to maintain access to reproductive health care. Did anybody think this was going to be like this in 2022? Because of reproductive justice's intersectional approach to identifying and addressing barriers to reproductive care, it is better equipped to engage the legal obstacles of how now we all encounter the problems due to the Supreme Court's decision to reverse Roe v. Wade. And so we need to continue our work. And as the great African-American poet and feminist Audre Lorde said, revolution is not a one-time event. Amen. And one last quote from the National Council of Jewish Women, who are a member of Sister Song, by the way. Reproductive health, rights, and justice go beyond the basics of reproduction. It requires us to dig deeper, to advocate louder, and to love harder. It requires us to center the voices of those who have been marginalized to lead the conversation for social change. Amen. Thank you. That is my end of my, my portion. And now I would like to uh, bring back Ingrid Nauman, who is going to answer some of Eric's questions and talk to you about access and intersectionality. Thank you. I'm going to pick up a clip so I don't trip on it. Uh, yeah, I didn't see it up there, so thank you. Got it. Sorry. Okay, thanks. Good. Okay. So, um, anybody want to stand up and stretch or just raise your arms or something? We've had a s wonderful service by Eric this morning, and we're sitting and we had lunch, and now we kind of want to go to sleep. But, soon. Soon. Okay. Oh, good. So reproductive justice um, cannot exist without self-determination. 
And in order to have self-determination, we need access to the choices we wish to make. Access to affordable health care. Earlier this year, the CDC reported more than four out of five women who die during pregnancy could have been saved with proper health care. Four out of five women who died during pregnancy could have been saved with proper health care. Access to a healthy environment, healthy and safe environment, regardless of who you are or where you live. Access to education, and again, regardless of who you are or where you live. Access is intertwined with intersectionality because of the disparity of access between people of privilege and those without. We've learned about intersectionality in our congregation. It is a tool that helps us understand how gender, gender identity, race, ethnicity, nationality, socioeconomic class, sexual orientation, disability, religion, and other aspects of our identities affect our lives. Our ability to exercise self-determination, including in our reproductive lives, is impacted by power inequities inherent in our society's institutions, environment, economics, and culture. So how is access to reproductive justice affected by who we are? Several factors impact access, including how much money we have, the color of our skin, gender identity and sexual orientation, immigration status, disability, and more. So what is reproductive justice if you can't pay for it? What is reproductive choice if you can't pay for it? Sorry. When there is a fight for raising the minimum wage, reproductive justice should be at the table. If what's driving you to choose abortion is that you don't have financial security, then the solution is an economic one. Affordable childcare, equal pay for equal work, and paid family leave are all part of reproductive justice. Systemic racism such as residential segregation, unfair lending practices, and other barriers to home ownership and accumulating wealth have been detrimental to access for people of color in the United States. This is reproductive injustice. Lack of access for people of color is particularly noticeable in the statistics related to maternity and infant health care. According to the CDC, black women die in the perinatal period during pregnancy and the year following pregnancy at three to four times the rate of white women. In a 2019 study, American Indian Alaska Native mothers were almost three times as likely to receive late or no prenatal care as compared to non-Hispanic white mothers. The infant mortality rate in the United States speaks loudly about the lack of access for people of color. The infant mortality rate in the U.S. is the highest for black infants at 10.8 deaths per 1,000 live births followed by American Indian Alaska Natives at 8.4, Hispanics at 5.0, whites at 4.6, and Asian American Pacific Islanders at 3.8. So barriers for people of color to access and care include systemic and interpersonal racism, distrust of the healthcare system, shame and stigma from societal and cultural pressures, fear of child protective services, and racism within the child welfare system. Logistical barriers such as transportation, taking time off from work, and affordable child care. America has a long history of forced sterilization, eugenics, and reproductive injustice. This history is tied to race. Before the end of the Civil War, black slaves were raped indiscriminately and the women were forced to bear their children of their oppressors. Black, Latino, Hispanic, and indigenous women have systematically been denied reproductive health care. They have had their fundamental bodily freedom violated by the state, both through the law and through its failure to provide accessible resources. 
This pattern continues to this day and is a barrier to reproductive justice. LGBTQ people need access to reproductive health care, including contraception, abortion, assisted reproductive services, HIV care, pregnancy care, parenting resources, and more. Although many people talk about reproductive health as a woman's issue, many LGBTQ people, including lesbian and bisexual women, transgender men, two-spirit, intersex, non-binary, and gender non-conforming individuals, can get pregnant, use birth control, have abortions, carry pregnancies, and become parents. Due to the legal right to turn away trans people in many places, some LGBTQ individuals have difficulty finding an OBGYN with whom to address an array of issues, including conversations ranging from fertility to treatment of ovarian cancer. The effort to criminalize abortion also carries strong implications for LGBTQ individuals in their capacity to exercise bodily autonomy in ways that are different from non-LGBTQ individuals. This is reproductive injustice. Reproductive justice is immigration justice. Immigrants, like any other person in the United States, are entitled to the protection of fundamental human rights and the repeated promise of our country to provide life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. However, this is not the reality. Immigrants, especially those living undocumented, represent a uniquely vulnerable group with little protection to their access to public services and health care like abortion. Undocumented immigrants are blocked from obtaining health care coverage through Medicaid, the Children's Health Insurance Program, and the ACA Marketplace by U.S. federal law. Going back to the safety issue, let's not forget about rampant abuse reported in recent years at U.S. immigrant housing camps. This is reproductive injustice. So how do we get there? We need to live in a healthy environment. We need safety for ourselves and our families. We need education for all. Reproductive health care without limits for everyone. So two areas of environmental of env our environment impacted by intersectionality are climate change and environmental injustice. Climate change exacerbates many risks for vulnerable populations, which tend to be low-income populations and communities of color. Because of economic oppression and systemic racism in housing practices, Pregnant people of color are more likely to live in locations that are closer to oil and gas drilling, areas, areas where there are, is a higher likelihood of extreme heat or air pollution, homes with lead-tainted water, and other environments that are known to lead to poor, if not deadly, pregnancy outcomes. People living with environmental injustices face an unfair added burden of health problems they are less able to prepare for and respond to the effects of climate change and pollution leading to potentially disastrous consequences. This is reproductive injustice. I'll switch gears here for a minute. Here's a question for you. What is the leading cause of death for pregnant people and new mothers in the United States? Hypertensive disorders or problems related to high blood pressure, hemorrhage or excessive bleeding, sepsis or infection, domestic violence. Any guesses? Anybody? Feel free, shout out, raise your hand. Me? Yeah? Me. Domestic violence. Ding, ding, ding. The answer is domestic violence. According to a recent study, pregnant people and new mothers are more likely to be murdered than they are to die of pregnancy-related complications. <sighs> okay. Go ahead and change the next slide. I'm going to stop there. Anybody angry yet? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, safe environment. By age 18, 
One in four girls will have been sexually assaulted. More than 55% of female deaths are related to partner violence, with a vast majority of those carried out by a male partner. Add in intersectionality and the numbers continue to grow. Bisexual women experience the highest rate of sexual violence at 61%. And 83% of women with disabilities are sexually assaulted. 83% of women with disabilities are sexually assaulted. Black and indigenous women are killed at significantly higher rates than women of other races. Hispanic women are the most likely to be killed in connection to partner violence. Missing and murdered indigenous women are an epidemic of violence in Canada, the United States, and Latin America. In the US, reauthorization of the Violence Against Women's Act that the current administration signed into law in March 2022 is a step in the right direction. Not only does it keep existing programs in place until 2027, it expands tribal court jurisdiction to cover non-native perpetrators of violent crime and increases services and support for survivors from underserved and marginalized communities. I do have a problem with the reauthorization ending in 2027, though. Do they think violence against women is going to stop? Reproductive justice is impacted by racial disparities and injustices in the US criminal system. One example is biased policing and sentencing of men and boys of color. African Americans are incarcerated in state prisons at five times the rate of whites. Racial disparities are also noticeable with black youth, as evidenced by the school to prison pipeline and higher rates of incarceration for black juveniles. Black men face disproportionately harsh incarceration experiences as compared with prisoners of other races. In the year 2000, no, 2020, not 2000, sorry. In 2020, protests erupted across the country in response to police brutality and killing of people of color. The Black Lives Matter movement was in the news every day and even painted on the streets of cities nationwide. There is much work to be done. Okay, so social injustices, including racism, gerrymandering, and voter suppression, have contributed to creating long-standing disparities in education access and, and quality. Schools in high poverty districts receive significantly less funding than their higher income counterparts, reducing the chances of students in these districts to receive a quality education. High poverty districts High poverty districts also often have more students who identify as people of color. Educational inequities are also seen in the sexuality education provided to students. Higher rates of teen pregnancy among students of color contribute to racial disparities in graduation rates. Teen pregnancy is linked to dropout rates as pregnancy and parenting responsibilities significantly affect girls' likelihood of graduating. Despite a federal law that prohibits sex discrimination in education, including discrimination based on pregnancy and related conditions, pregnant and parenting teens face many barriers to staying in school. Such barriers include insufficient time to recover after giving birth, not being allowed to make up missed work, being forbidden from receiving student recognition or participating in extracurricular activities, no childcare or transportation, and stigmatization. When parents are unable to surmount these barriers, their children are also less likely to reach their full educational potential, contributing to intergenerational poverty. When age-appropriate, scientifically-based sex education can reduce rates of both teen pregnancy and high school dropout, it becomes obvious how much education is a matter of reproductive justice. Again, there is much work to be done. Okay, another question for you. With states having the power to protect, how many states currently have protective policies to reproductive health care? 22, 8, 
30 or 12? B. You think it's B? Thank you for shouting out. Yes? Well, the answer is 12. Not quite as bad as we thought. <laughs> Recently, the Guttmacher Institute, a leading nonprofit organization that has been tracking reproductive health care and rights since 1968, produced this map showing that there are only 12 states that have protective policies to reproductive health care, including abortion. The states in light blue or turquoise, and then Oregon all alone in dark blue, go Oregon, have the most protective abortion policies. The dark red are the most restrictive states. Who knew? This map shows that 38 states have few or no protective policies for reproductive health care. Now there is some good news in the recent election. California and Vermont, already in light blue, and Michigan in yellow, all passed measures ensuring reproductive freedom or the right to personal reproductive autonomy. Nevada also just passed a sweeping equal rights amendment joining about 20 other states, including Washington, that have passed ERAs to their constitutions that provide various degrees of legal protection against discrimination based on sex. Yay. Yes, yay. And there is some hope for Kansas, Kentucky, and Montana, all with restrictions. Voters in those states rejected proposed anti-abortion measures on the ballot this year. Yes. Okay. So, let's talk about abortion access. Abortion care is essential health care. Everyone has the right to accessible, high-quality abortion care, and no one should be criminalized for seeking or accessing abortion services. In the US, one in four women will end a pregnancy in her lifetime. One in four women will end a pregnancy in her lifetime. Yet, because of a decades-long effort by anti-abortion lawmakers, 90% of counties in the US are without a single abortion provider. And although most US maternal deaths are preventable, the country has the highest maternal mortality rate among wealthy nations. In addition, contraception and assisted reproductive services are often unaffordable and out of reach for many. So who's getting abortions? 60% of people who have had abortions are already parents. The majority are in their 20s, but the age range spans from early adolescence to much older. Most identify as heterosexual and have some sort of religious affiliation. 75% identify as having financial insecurity. 34% identify as white, 28% as black, and 25% as Hispanic. Now, due to the merger of Virginia Mason and CHI Franciscan in 2021, creating Virginia Mason Franciscan Health, a large number of Washington hospitals are now controlled by the Catholic doctrine. With that merger, Virginia Mason said it would not become Catholic, but also would no longer provide elective abortions or participate in the state's death with dignity process. This contributes to the lack of access in our state, liberal though it may be. So basically, Eric, the answer to your question is anyone affiliated with the Virginia Mason Franciscan Health? That's Providence. That's Providence. That's Providence. And? That's yes, exactly. So in the 2022, this past Washington legislative session, the Keep Our Care Act was introduced. This would give the state attorney general the power to block hospital mergers if they would limit access to abortion care, gender-affirming health care, or physician-assisted suicide. The act failed to move forward, but supporters of the bill plan to reintroduce it in the 2023 legislative session. The Guttmacher Institute has estimated that the row, with Roe overturned, 
Washington State will see a 385% increase in the number of people traveling here for abortion care, expected largely from Idaho and Montana to the east. I know I'm repeating myself, but there is much work to be done. So addressing access and intersectionality is an integral part of reproductive justice. It was difficult to separate these issues because so many of them intertwine. As Audre Lorde wrote, there is no thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. Now please welcome Karen back to talk about Unitarian Universalism and reproductive justice. Thank you. Hello again. Now I know after that you all need to shake some stuff off, right? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> That's a lot, right? So let's talk about you use, all of us, and how we move forward with reproductive justice. So since well before Roe v. Wade, Unitarian Universalists have clearly, clearly supported every person's right to make decisions about our own bodies, reproductive health, and, that including, and, and including the decision to seek abortion care. Throughout the 20th and 21st centuries, UUs have supported movements working to make abortion accessible and affordable and to destigmatize abortion within our society. In fact, it was nearly 60 years ago in 1963 that the first UU resolution on choice took place. The resolution was titled Reform of Abortion Statutes making the Unitarian Universalist Association the first religious tradition to officially endorse a woman's right to choose. I want to point out, thank you, I want to point out that this took place 10 years before Roe v. Wade was legalized. Uh, you use, we're ahead of it, we're progressive. So while Unitarian Universalists have long been present in the movement for abortion rights, reproductive health, and comprehensive sexuality education, we're newer to the reproductive justice movement. And it was in 2015 at the General Assembly that the UUA passed a statement of conscience, conscience affirming our commitment to organizing in solidarity with the broader reproductive justice movement, which is why they are in part partnership with Sister Son. The, the um, statement in brief says, Unitarian Universalists follow the lead of and are accountable to marginalized groups, using our positions of power to support these communities. We speak loudly in the religious arena as the religious voice has often been used to limit access to reproductive health justice and health care. As you use part in, reproduct in the reproductive justice movement, we strive to build a world in which all people are able to make choices about their bodies, their health, and their families within safe and thriving communities. And in practice, this commitment includes working toward reproductive care and abortion for all identities, supporting people's decision on when, how, and if they choose to have children. We support sexual and reproductive health during our entire lives. 
and we create safe and healthy environments for our families and our children. For more information on the Statement of Conscious, we have handouts. We have a resource table in the back of the room, and we have handouts that made copies of this, or you can find it at uua.org. And then in 2022, at this year's General Assembly, an action of immediate witness titled, We Do Not Consent, Rejecting Legal Challenges to Abortion, which was due to the Roe v. Wade overturn, was overwhelmingly passed. Here is a select summary of the resolutions within the AIW that call on you use to educate and reflect. We do so by deepening our commitment for action in ways that don't cause further harm to people. We advocate through media outlets, through letter writing, or through direct action. To witness, we can speak out publicly as people of faith. Or we can organize. There are many ways to organize. And recently, several members of UUC attended the UUA's educational series, Congregational Reproductive Justice Organizing. How many of you are, uh, attended that here? I know June and <laughs> several of us. And they have since formed the EUUC Reproductive Justice Work Group. This work group mobilizes specifically around the current issue of reproductive injustice occurring in the US. If you're interested in learning more about this work group and how you can take part in organizing right here at, at U, uh, as a UU member here, please visit the resource table. We have these green slips. You take one, it has the uh, email information on there and email this group and they'll let you know ways you can help through organizing with them. Now, you may have noticed that these resolutions refer to you use taking action. And I believe this means all you use. And not only specific groups of you use, like women, or pregnant people, or people of color, or people living in conservative states whose rights are being trampled on. It doesn't only call on those who have to travel for an abortion or receive gender-affirming care, or those who live in fear of persecution, prosecution for protecting their bodily autonomy, or only for those who have to tolerate unsafe conditions for their children to take action for reproductive justice. It calls on all of us, including, and perhaps, especially people with pr a privilege who do not have to suffer these injustices. Amen. And one of these groups has a special power to support this movement, and they are men. Amen. We can't do this with half the population. We need and welcome men into this movement, and thank you to the men who are here with us today. So yeah, there's another question. Imagine the results of achieving reproductive justice. What do you think would change? Think about this for a moment and we'll do a shout out on it. What would change if we reached, if we achieved reproductive justice? Talk amongst yourselves. Does anybody want to shout out something? More women and babies will be alive. 
more women and babies would be alive. Awesome, June. That is very, very true, as we heard from the dire statistics that uh, Ingrid shared with us. And I'd like to give you the answers right now. Well, guess what? Everyone would have the basic human rights to maintain personal bodily autonomy, to have children, to not have children, and to parent the children we have in safe and sustainable communities. The answers are there. Everyone benefits from reproductive justice. Everyone stands to benefit from understanding and joining the reproductive justice movement. Reproductive justice recognizes the intersecting social, political, and economic inequalities that affect a person's ability to access reproductive health care services. With the overturning of Roe v. Wade, all women, children, and people in the 2S LGBTQ plus communities face barriers to reproductive health care through political interference. In closing, our Unitarian Universalist faith affirms that all of our bodies are sacred and that we are each endowed with the twin gifts of agency and conscience. Each of us should have the power to decide what does and doesn't happen to our bodies at every moment of our lives because consent and bodily autonomy are holy. And when disparities in resources or freedoms make it more difficult for certain groups of people to exercise autonomy over their own bodies, the Unitarian Universalist faith compels us to take liberatory action. And that is the end of my program, but I do want you to, and I thank you all for coming today, and I do want you to please watch for more upcoming events that A4W will be offering on reproductive justice for the, before the May vote for the stand. And now we have time for a few questions. Does anybody have any questions you would like to ask of us today? And if we don't know them, we'll say, we don't know. <laughs> I have a couple of hands, a gentleman right here. So, do these religiously affiliated hospitals receive any sort of public funding? You know, I believe that they do. Um, who has information? There's somebody here who might have information on how they do get funded, but they, they are funded by federal, even, and, so and state. They're allowed to use their religion? Lisa, right behind you, has something, I think, to add to this. She's so, they said it would be better if you went up there. Do you want, yeah, great, Lisa, come on up. Yeah, can you repeat the question? We will. We'll repeat the question. So, Lisa, can you repeat the question? So, the question was whether, whether religiously affiliated <clears throat> hospitals got public funding. And they get public funding, I mean, they certainly get Medicare and Medicaid funding, which is substantial. And um, they don't necessarily get direct grants, although they may get tax breaks because many of them are um, nonprofits. So, there are, there are ways in which they do get publicly funding and in which um, I'm just going to relate this back to um, to um, the past. When they created Medicare and Medicaid, they said that only hospital that hospitals had to serve everyone, and hospitals continued to discriminate. And the way they did it, the federal government forced that, and I can't remember which administration it was under, is that they um, they went in and they tested the hospital to see if they, they were serving both races, um, people of color and white um, patients equally, and then they closed down 11 hospitals across the country, and it changed overnight. I mean, the public money is huge and needs to be utilized to, to um, make sure that all people are served. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. And you had a question over here? Yeah. Uh, I love 
love that question. Is there a list of the, and are you talking about the hospitals? Yeah, hospitals that were fundamentally not providing the Right, and this was a question that Cynthia had actually asked of us too, and we do not have the list of which of those facilities you know, our, we don't have an exact list. It's something that I think advocates could look into and then we can um, give that information out. If there's anyone here who knows of how we can get our hands on that list. It's, it's on the internet. I, I've seen it before. Or, but anything that has anticipate, providence, peace, the peace one that's up in Whatcom County, any of them that has any of that in their name, Perfect. Why don't you come up, Marilyn, and tell us all that. And we do have a couple other announcements after we take a couple more questions, too. But, Marilyn, if you want to um, repeat the question and maybe that will be answered, too. Yeah, how do you know if hospitals are religiously affiliated? And you can find it out on the Internet. And it is really important before you go to one, for example, if you're pregnant or miscarrying or whatever, while your tube's tight or whatever, you need to know because they won't be able to help you with that and they don't always tell you right away. So anything with Franciscan, Providence, the Peace, Peace something is in Whatcom County, those are all Catholic. And I don't know if Kindred may also be Catholic, uh, but there's a, I think about 45% of hospital beds in Washington are Catholic. So one big system, the University of Washington Medical Center, and all the other regions are not um, religiously affiliated. Only Lakeland is not. And I don't know, that's not an extensive school because. Can you go back up there and speak? I'll say it for Joyce. Yeah, she said UW system is not religiously affiliated in Overlake. Things like you have to look a little deeper because Swedish, for example, you'd think that is not, but it is. Providence. And Kaiser also uses some of their services, but they also have some of them. Yeah. So. Thank you. All right, thank you. Is there any other questions uh, for the group right now? Oh, thank you all for, oh wait, we have one more, yeah, sure. So, just as a follow-up, so if they're receiving public money and they're using their religion to deny people health care, is, is that sort of a constitutional problem, would you say? <laughs> it, <laughs> it certainly sounds like it. There is, th this is, repeat. Okay, okay, repeat the question. Could you want to say your question again so we can? Um, sure, I, I just asked, um, is it a constitutional problem that these religious affiliated hospitals are receiving, religiously affiliated hospitals are receiving public money and using their religion to deny people abortion? So is it a constitutional problem that these hospitals are receiving public funding and then turning away people for services that they, that they need? On the basis of on the basis of religion. Well, you see, there's the, oh, there was the separation of religious religion and state. The Constitution, I don't know. I, I believe they are following the Constitution and the laws that, they're, that are within. Um, so there are loopholes within all of this that are happening. This is something that the co next coming legislation, uh, which is gonna be coming up in 2023, keep your eye out for this and take action on it. Advocates for Women has done letter writing campaigns and um, done lobbying on this specific issue. It's a real, it's a really huge issue and it kind of um, came up on, snuck up on us. It was going on for a long time and people didn't really know about it. And then, it, then there was a lot of light shed on it. And so now it's in motion and 
now it's harder to turn it around. But we will. Any other? We have a question back here, Julie? That is correct. Vasectomies are involved here. Um, for the male, yes, they will not provide vasectomy services. Also, thank you. That is true. So, any other questions? Julie, I mean, uh, June, sorry. Um, it's just a comment that, so as these hospitals are being taken over by religions, so the training nurses and doctors who would be providing them this service, the training won't be happening either. Right, the training for the doctors and nurses in this care, within the, for this type of care, reproductive care, within these hospitals is not taking place also due to that. There's no need for them to, to do this. So, so there's going to be extra care, uh, the training. Hospitals, I don't believe that there are. Eric might have. I, we could maybe look into that. <laughs> Julie? Yes. Yes. They well, they were just hands. But I was told that that the image that I mean it would reflect all the cultures that we have been Very Oh well, thank you. You know what? That was just something that all of this is just came from Karen's brain, and so Karen's brain didn't catch that there was an inner uh, a more diverse. Handheld, that is not a UU stock image. That's just something Karen thought, I think I'll put this chalice right in the middle of these hands. And that. <laughs> we love you, Karen. <laughs> That's how that happened. But you know what? It's a cool image, and we'll change that up for the next one. Thank you, Julie, for bringing that to our attention. All right. And so I'd like to just thank you all for being here today. And for joining us, I have a couple of quick announcements because I would like to thank all the members of the A4W committee for your volunteer support today and your commitment to A4W. Thank you. We love you all. And also, in addition, I would like to send a big thank you to Cynthia Grace and her amazing audio visual. Thank you for supporting us today, Cynthia. A couple more things. You may have noticed we're wearing these green bandanas. Ha, ha, ha. What is that all about? <laughs> the color green and the green bandana is the international symbol of the fight to keep abortion legal. Green. That's why all of our slides are green. And as a thank you, we'd like you to each take one from the resource table on your way out. Marilyn's holding them right now. Wear them proudly in support of reproductive justice. Also, I've noticed the surveys have gone out, and I hope you've all had time to fill them out. They're a brief survey. Uh, please fill those out so we'll know how to serve you better in the future. Thank you all again. Enjoy your afternoon.